First tonight, the struggles of a prominent Nigerian journalist, political activist and former presidential candidate, Omoyele Shore, struggles that have made him a household name in Nigeria. The saga of his arrests and re-arrests by the Nigerian authorities in violation of court orders and the drama of those arrests amid images of Mr. Shore pinned to the ground during scuffles with state security agents at a court hearing has focused attention on what some say is the shocking abuse of power and total disregard of human rights by Nigeria's secret police, the DSS. And it's threatened to undermine what little reputation Nigeria has as a country governed by the rule of law. Despite often being granted bail by the courts, the Nigerian authorities often continued to hold him, sparking a national and international outcry. And all because he insisted that this country must be run on the platform of the rule of law and must not resort to gangsterism. He has, of course, called for revolution and was arrested and charged with treason for attempting to take his revolution now protests across the country. Well, for more about his experiences and his current take on where things are in Nigeria, I'm suitably delighted to say that the human rights activist, journalist, founder of the US-based news website, Sahara Reporter, and former presidential candidate, Omoyele Shoare, joins me now in the studio. Absolutely brilliant to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. And the question that everybody is asking is, having had the opportunity to leave, why did you come back? Well, I did say while well, I was uh, being tried and suppressed and oppressed that I would never leave Nigeria under any circumstance and I only live on my own terms and come back on my own terms and I've said repeatedly that I could have left if I wanted even though my passports were seized I knew all the routes to get out of this country I used to help people get in and out of Nigeria through what we call the Nadeko routes. <laughs> but this time around, I said I wasn't going anywhere. Well, I hope they're not going to come after you for saying you helped people no, get I, in No, because out. the person who is president of Nigeria today okay, when you, that, used that to was, pass through that route yeah, yeah, himself. That, that was the... Um, that was the, how he left during Nigeria. The, yeah, yeah, during military, oh, the military rule. Yeah, yeah, so, okay, yeah. Yeah, so he's, uh, he's a very... Uh, he's, he's one of the people who uses that route. So, mm. And they couldn't close it after they started coming through the legal routes. But I don't do that anymore either. I come in and out uh, through what they call illegal routes. That's mm. why I waited for my passport to be returned to me because it was my property. And when I left, I decided to come back, which was a promise I made that I'll be back. Well, I'm sure your supporters will be very glad to see that you're back and yeah. that we're very happy to have you here uh, on Arise News. So has that monster of your arrests, re-arrests and court appearances now returned to the shadows? Has that lemon been fully squeezed, as they say, or is there more to come? And we should expect the knives of the DSS to be out again for you. Actually, I came back primarily to attend to another court case. Mm. I have another criminal trial that was uh, put in place before I left. By that's a, a cyber crime case. Case, yes. So that's, and I promised the judge I'll be back, and I came back for that. I cannot promise anybody. I can't even promise myself that I won't get into trouble again because this is the job and the work we do. It's the job of conscience. Mm. And when you fight against the monsters that are holding your country down, they are bound to come after you at all times. And by the way, the DSS still has refused to return my funds to me, even though there's a court order to that effect. And they also haven't paid me several uh, court uh, awards uh, that was given during my last five years here, saying that uh, they violated my rights. Uh, so the violations are still in place, and I'm sure they will do more for as long as I do what I do. I'm talking about violations. It's been said that the DSS and the Buhari administration didn't just cut legal corners in their attempt to nail you. I mean, they drove past the whole block. Uh, but still, in the face of all that, here you are standing tall, at least on the surface. But how much would you say you've lost in your sort of obdurate battle with the Nigerian authorities? How much of a stain has it left behind? You know, nobody should be counting their losses when the battle and the war is not yet over. So we're still at it. And there's no point at this point in saying this is what I lost 
uh, intrinsically. This is what I came to do uh, in this life, and I'm going to do it. And uh, history will judge losses, and uh, will judge. It's not about profit. So I'm here as a witness to history and a participant in it. But and what I did done say, to you must must have. Oh yeah, hurt I mean, and, and some and of it. Home. Yeah, I, you know, the biggest is probably the separation from family. I left my kids when they were uh, toddlers, and by the time I went back, they were full grown adults. When I left the U.S. in 2019, I was the second tallest person in the house, <laughs> my wife being the first. When I went back, I was the shortest person in the house. So that tells you something. Someone said that as far as Omoyele Shore is concerned, the Nigerian authorities have learned something, and that is that there is nothing to be gained by abusing him. So hopefully they will stop doing that. He, that, they, they, that he can be persuaded or cajoled, but he can't be browbeaten because any such attempt simply makes him obstinate. Is that fair comment? No, I think one must understand that in history, uh, when you look at the French Revolution, the people who were ousted by the revolution are known as Bourbons. Mm. And there's something that was said about them by a diplomat. He said, you know, they learn nothing, but they forget nothing. They, they're not going to learn until they are not around to remember anything right. anymore. Yes. How difficult in those circumstances is it being a political activist in Nigeria? I didn't start today. It's, you know, I started when it was really, really difficult. And that was under military rule when we were in the university. And you've probably heard my stories of having been expelled twice from the university when we started out. I started out when I was around 19 years old, when I arrived at the University of Lagos, freshman. And the biggest battle, the most dangerous thing to do was to fight the military. Mm. Uh, that was ex outside of the campus. Inside of the campus, the most dangerous thing to do was to fight against cultism, you know, uh, university gangsterism. And I did all of that. So I've been through the furnace. And uh, like a friend of mine would say, he said, you know, uh, a graphite can be pencil and it could be, I could, it could be diamond. So it depends on how long it stays in the furnace, under, underneath the earth. But the ineluctable fact appears to be that activism is in your DNA. I don't want to go that far, you know, but I know that uh, I love social justice to the point that I'm willing to risk it off for social justice to be enabled wherever I find myself. And it doesn't matter whether the person is small or big or the issue is gigantic or just minute. I love to fight for justice. And I've been doing it since I was very little. Uh, particularly, my activism life started with being myself at the age of 10 when my village was invaded by the police in 1980. That was where I made the decision that when I grew up, I'm going to fight back uh, as strongly as I could. Uh, so, and I was inspired by every other social movements around the world and persons. And um, I just took it on when I got to invest and I met the likes of Femi Fallon, who started being my lawyer since 1992 and remains my lawyer to date. Never paid him a dime before. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think you're, you're, you're very courageous and, you're, and you're, the intrepid things that you have done will continue to inspire many Nigerians. Um, but what happens next now that the fury of your battle with the DSS appears to have subsided, but your perception and that of many Nigerians that a grave injustice has been done to you persists? Well, it's nothing personal, uh, and I must say this, because you will find out with Nigeria that each time an injustice is done against you, uh, the worst or the bigger injustice is coming for as long as the system remains this way it is, operated by different operatives at different times. But it looks to me like all of them have the same direction. You see, we've had democracy. Mm. The people we call democrats today, or people who operated as Democrats today had people who are even worse than some of the things we used to get away with under the military, you can't get away with it now. I mean, this is 2024. People are still being arrested and detained under the Cybercrime Act of 2015. Don't forget, the Cybercrime Act 
came from the PDP. And the APC continued with it. And that was the same law that used to be called sedition before mm. the colonial masters left. So nothing has changed. The operators will change, the dates will change, but the character of the Nigerian state as a police state, as an abuser of rights, as a chaotic, you know, corrupt system, rotten system, has continued. And that is where people like us cannot also change our ways. You know, I think it was uh, Chinua Achebe who wrote about uh, that f famous bed that says, you know, if the hunter will learn to shoot without missing, I will learn to fly without mm. perching. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and, and just very, very briefly, tell yeah. us about that court case, the cyber case, court case well, that I, you have at the moment. I was at, what are I, the circumstances? One day I was uh, coming out of the Court of Appeal and some policemen came. That was while I was restricted to Abuja. Don't forget I was restricted to Abuja for three years by a judge. And they said there was another petition against me. And I went to the office and they said, a so-called billionaire, I think his name is Ned Nwoku, said, we wrote a report, on Sahara reporters at that time, against him. And as, as a result, I've committed a cyber crime. First, they said it was a uh, penal code, you know, of defamation. And they wanted me to write this. I said, I'm not writing any statement. Next few days, they took me before a judge. And that was 2021, and said they're charging me for cyber crime. And the judge didn't make any determination until the treasonable tr felony trial was over. The federal government came, the same judge, Justice uh, Unwiti, the, maker, the federal government came and said, we're no longer interested in the treasonable felony. And the judge ruled a week later that I should come back for trial for this side. So we went, we came back uh, on May 2nd for the trial. And still, they were unable to uh, arraign me because we protested strongly. I can't be served as the entire go of Sahara reporters. Reason being that the president of Nigeria today is one of the biggest publishers of news. And before he became president, nobody charging for cyber crime for stories on the nation or what he did on his TV station. I heard he has over seven radio stations. He has never been arrested or even questioned before. So I'm a publisher too. Why am I targeted? But I understand that they're doing it because they have issues with me. They have an axe to grind with me. And so, but I told them, you have to respect that Sahara Reporters is a separate entity from myself. And if you want to dispute any story, you can write a region at first. Secondly, you can go to a civil court. You have no right to be using the instrumentality of a cyber crime law to harass people. And as we speak, a young journalist has been in detention for the last five days, kidnapped from Lagos, over a story he wrote about a former special assistant to Buhari uh, on SDG, a former official about corruption in the SDG. We went to see the police. Why are you holding this guy? They gave us bail conditions that made it sound like the guy killed somebody. <laughs> Go and bring two directors with landed property. Well, like even the people who are stealing billions in this country don't get those kind of stringent. And this is police administrative bail condition now. And then we later found out that they're punishing the guys from uh, FIJ. Nigeria, that's uh, this Foundation for Investigative Journalists, because they wrote a story that the IG was linked with a smuggler. That's what happened. So this is where we are in 2024, sedition all over again. But I understand that they are using all of these encumbrances to stand in my way so that we will not get to the, it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. So I won't get to that destination that I promised myself when I entered the university, when I was 10 years old, I would break the back of oppression in this country and bring prosperity and development to bear on Nigeria. And you can imagine, uh, and we, we were having a conversation before I came, you, 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 your family is in the UK, you know, you can imagine what, how I felt in the last one and a half months in the US, how the world has moved beyond and above us, and where we're still. It's like we are dragging ourselves, we will take one step forward and 50 backwards. Yeah, it, it can be depressing. It's very depressing. You know, but instead of being depressed, we should all unite and end our misery. Right. Yes. And, and um, just going beyond you personally yeah. to get your sense of other sort of issues in this country. Um, one of them, of course, Namdi Kanu, yes. who remains in custody and whose continued incarceration some people see as the 
unfairness of the Nigerian system because other separatist agitators from other ethnic groups have been freed whilst Mr. Kanu, who is Igbo, remains in custody. What are your thoughts on that? Because the argument is that he was charged to court and the courts freed him, but he's still locked up. Well, what you must know is that Namdi Kanu is being held hostage on behalf of the famed unity of Nigeria. That's what it's all about. It's as simple as that. If you mention his name in certain circles, they don't want to hear it because they feel like he threatens the real estate called Nigeria. And his Igbo makes it worse because Nigeria's DNA hates the Igbo for attempting, you know, in the 60s and, you know, towards the end of the 70s, to leave a country they said is no longer favorable to their existence. But I keep saying, and I will repeat here again, is there any Nigerian out there in the majority who has not mentally seceded from Nigeria? Not many. That's why people are living in droves. Each time you get on a plane leaving this country is full, each time it's coming back, probably full too, but it is those who are coming back to pack their things that are coming back. That's the way I describe mm. it. But the truth is that Unam de Kanu has been held hostage. He was abducted from Kenya, extraordinary rendition. The fact that he's, in his, he's kidnapped from Kenya could not be explained shows that any judicial pronouncement or processes after that is null and void. You cannot go and kidnap somebody and bring them before a, a court. And the courts have made it very clear, even up to the Supreme Court, that he did not jump bail. It was a military that went to his house to kill people, and then he escaped. And now you have brought him back, you ought to respect and restore his bill. That's what I told his lawyers. Why are you applying for bail again? Because the Supreme Court made all the pronouncements except releasing him. And I think mm. it was because they were afraid. And that's why I said he's his hostage to this country. And like you rightly said, the other people who have made even more egregious pronouncements and fought and carried arms in this country. And you have not treated them the same way because they're not Namde Kanu's. Uh, you know, their name don't sound East. And I'm not here to fetish being able, but the reality is that they are not treated fairly. And Namdi Kano is part of the reason why that is clear to everybody. Right. And by the way, I must also reveal here that there are some Igbo elites who are behind this. You know, whenever there's a crime of conspiracy against freedom fighters, there are people inside and outside who are working together. Well, let's return to you. Yes. Are you going to run again for president in 2027? So let me give you a cliche. I never stop running, even after the 2018, 2019 election. But that is not to say that I will be running perpetually for office. My goal is to make this country work in my lifetime. And do you have a master plan to achieve that? Goal? I have made it public. I was the first person to bring a digital master plan um, to be on Nigeria. Even, and this I can provide, even the so-called coastal highway, I was the first person to talk about it from in 2018 when I visited Badagri for a town hall meeting. But mine was supposed to start from Badagri to Calabar and eventually to go from there to Senegal because I believe in the unity of the African so continent. So you support that coastal highway? Well, I don't support the one they are building now. <laughs> because <laughs> but you support the one that you want to yes, build? Yes, because the one they are building now is the Atlantic outlet. Right. Yes. And I would predict here today, the coastal highway they are building is probably going to end up at the Dangote refinery because it's meant for transporting high-level workers from the Atlantic to the refinery and back for the same. After that, you would never hear about the coastal highway again because that's the design. And I don't know why journalists have not asked for us to have the real full master plan. It makes it sound today that the coastal highway <laughs> is only about, you know, uh, what's that place they are demolishing there? Uh, the landmark. The landmark. Yeah. No. The coastal highway, we're supposed to have a model that is shown to us on TV every day. This is <laughs> the digital model. Well, in fairness, they've shown a route. The route the, the is route not, I'm talking about the model on where we right. pass, you know. But now we only have, they said they're only doing 47 kilometers. And I don't forget that the people who are building the coastal highway, the high-tech people, also had promised to build highways from Lagos to Epe, and mm. they've been doing it for probably 30, 20 years since Tudubu came to power. 
never got past the state. That's why I'm saying this is a 47 kilometer highway meant to just provide an outlet for the Bundungu, the building called the Eco Atlantic. Because how was it that people were going to come in there and bring 300,000 people and there's no other, any other outlet? So the coastal highway now is going to be built by Nigeria for a private uh, investor, real estate investor. That's right. what it is about. So this is not the coastal highway that I wanted to build. <laughs> Well, we'll have to see what yes. happens there. Yeah. But well, we're almost out of time, and yeah. it's an absolute delight to have you here. But you called for revolution yes. now. Yes. That was one of the reasons you were charged with treason. That's right. But should it be about revolution or about reform? I mean, there's a difference there, isn't there? Why I was calling for revolution is that I spent two years at Columbia University in New York, an Ivy League school. That's a very good school. Yes. Yeah. One of the best 10 in the U.S. Yeah. And most people have never heard this about me before. And part of the reason I attended Columbia University was because they were calling me lay about at the University of Lagos <laughs> because I was an activist. And I went to one of the best schools in the world. And I know what reforms are about from the World Bank, you know, from mm. the internet. And Nigeria's case has gone beyond reform. Only a revolution that can address the issue. But guess what? The revolution used to be a taboo word in 2019 when I was using it. Now it's freely used. Everybody's calling for a revolution, including those who were opposed to it in 2019. Mm. It's beyond me, but I would say this because it's important for the public that revolutions that are supposed to happen will happen no matter how long it will take. You can only suppress people only for a time. But the Nigerian revolution is building up. You know, what builds up a revolution are the ingredients you have in place. And suppress of ethnic groups, suppress of free speech, journalists, taxation without responsibility, you know. And I wanted to say about landmark that I was aware that they're not demolishing landmark just because they want to build a road. They had been targeting the landmark guy even before now. They refused to let him have a water corporation land that he wanted to build part of, you know, because they said, oh, we are too powerful here. You know, these are things that have been going on for a long time. So it is not by accident that they are demolishing the place. There, is, there are connotations to it. And I'm, out, you know, and, and I'm saying it publicly right. here. Yes. So basically, broadly speaking, yeah. we're out of time, but just very briefly. And the, broadly the, speaking, the approaching specifically storm, speaking, the approaching storm is still approaching. Oh, yes. It's just a matter of time. And it's going to happen whether I lead it <laughs> or not. It's just a matter of time. It's a ticking bomb because you cannot hold people to ransom for this long and you will not be suffering consequences for it. It's going to blow up in their faces. It's a matter of time. You heard it from me, and you can arrest me after I said it, but well, that would not, not stop the revolution. Hopefully not. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Showere, very, very delighted to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Omoyele Showere is a human rights activist, journalist, founder of the U.S.-based news website Sahara Reporters, and former presidential candidate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. Thank you.